colleague in the Department of Chemistry to introduce our next speaker, Scott Burr, Professor of Chemistry. Scott. It is rare that a scientist has the opportunity to participate in a wave of research that defines whole new areas of science. It is rarer still that scientists help to start that wave rolling. Our next speaker, Dr. Charles L. Sawyers, is one of those very rare scientists. Not long ago, the treatment options for cancer, if they existed, were limited to at least one of the following. Excision, involving surgery to remove the cancerous cells along with a margin of healthy cells. Radiation, to damage cells in and around the tumor mass so badly that they die. And chemotherapeutics, that target all dividing cells, which in addition to cancer cells, include things like hair follicles, cells lining the gastrointestinal tract, and bone marrow, which produces critical components of our immune systems. Dr. Sawyers, in collaboration with Dr. Brian Drucker of Oregon Health and Science University, and Dr. Nicholas Leiden of Seba Geigy Pharmaceuticals, began to change that. Dr. Sawyers and his collaborators recognized that cells implicated in a type of blood cancer called chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, are different from normal cells because of the presence of the so-called Philadelphia chromosome. This chromosome encodes for a cancer-driving protein that is only produced in cancerous cells. Based upon this observation, Gleevec was developed to target this abnormal protein, thus killing only the cancerous cells. While this was a very welcome development for CML patients, the proof of concept that we can target things that distinguish cancer cells from normal cells helped define a fault line in the way we think about treating cancer. Today, targeted therapies are mainstream. The idea of precision medicine was kick-started by the success of Gleevec. One of the characteristics of cancer cells, however, is the fast rate of mutation that their genes undergo. As a consequence, drugs that target a specific protein can become less effective as the cells either change the structure of the target or devise ways to evade the drug. Understanding and overcoming drug resistance, then, is the next big challenge. And Dr. Sawyers is, of course, at the forefront. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Sawyers to the Nobel Conference to help us understand the nature of this new challenge. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my lecture. My name is Charles Sawyers. I'm a cancer biologist and oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, speaking to you from my office. In um, Upper East Side of Manhattan. I've titled my talk, Are There Magic Bullets for Cancer? in reference to the concept first articulated by Paul Ehrlich, a German scientist, um, more than a century ago, to illustrate the concept of a drug that could kill the diseased cell without causing damage to normal cells. And that's exactly what targeted therapy of cancer is which is gonna be the topic of my lecture. And it's a nice counterpoint to the lecture you heard from Dr. June on immunotherapy. So to frame the conversation, let's start with the basics. Um, when I was training um, a long time ago, there are only three ways in which we would treat cancer. The three pillars, meaning surgery, if the tumor is caught early enough, it can be removed and often times cured versus Two other therapies, radiation and chemotherapy, both of which work under the principle of damaging the DNA of tumor cells, putting breaks in the DNA strand such that it can't undergo replication. Unfortunately, it's nearly impossible to restrict that DNA damage to the tumor cells. Normal cells are damaged as collateral damage, and that explains the side effects that we're all so this has long led to the notion that we need a new class of cancer therapies and targeted therapy, which I'll tell you about, 
is based on the genetic alterations in tumor cells. Before we get started with specific examples, however, we need to understand the principles underlying a targeted therapy. And that goes back to fundamental biology, many of which many of you listening have learned in high school uh, or certainly college. And that is based on the discovery more than 30 years ago that cancer is a disease of genes. Mutations in genes in normal cells occur. And if they're in the wrong gene, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, that mutation can cause that normal cell to turn into a cancer cell. Um, we now know there are two broad classes of these cancer-causing genes, or what we now call cancer drivers. The oncogenes, shown on the top, and the tumor suppressor genes, shown on the bottom. And one way of thinking about oncogenes um, is to think of them as uh, gas pedals, dominant mutations that cause cells to grow on, in an uncontrolled rogue fashion. On the bottom, we have tumor suppressor genes. These are genes whose normal function is to restrain the growth of normal cells or actually completely stop it when it's not supposed to grow, as in a differentiated skin cell, which should, which should no longer proliferate. Um, this slide illustrates this in cartoon form. On the left-hand side, we see genes whose normal function is to cause cells to proliferate, to divide, etc. We call those proto-oncogenes. Um, and in situations where a mutation occurs in the wrong spate part of a proto-oncogene, it can turn into a bona fide oncogene. On the other side are tumor suppressor genes. Here's an example of the oncogene, you know, turning into, uh, of the proto-oncogene turning into an oncogene. Um, on the other side are the tumor suppressor gene. If one of those gets disabled, the cell may be okay because it has a backup copy. But if you lose the other copy, um, the cell has now lost the breaks in which um, it would normally stop cell growth. Again, leading to un uncontrolled proliferation, potentially cancer. Um, so what does this have to do with developing targeted therapy? Well, a fairly straightforward concept would be the following. If you have a proto-oncogene that has a mutation that turns it into an oncogene, shown here, that results in the production of a mutant protein, shown here, and then, which then propagates a signal that leads the cell to divide uncontrollably. Why not make a drug that selectively blocks the, activation, the, the activity of the mutant protein, but doesn't interfere with the normal copy of the proto-oncogene? Can we do that? Well, one example that I'd like to describe to you now um, is the drug called Gleevec or imatinib. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in the very beginnings of this story back more than 25 years ago. And the disease for which Gleevec is so effective is a form of leukemia called chronic myeloid leukemia. So just to make sure we're on the same page, what is leukemia? Leukemia is a cancer of the blood, which results in the production of too many white blood cells. We can diagnose it in a number of ways, but one simple way is to make a blood smear and just look under the microscope. And as you can see on the right, there are too many of these white blood cells surrounded by this sea of red blood cells. Um, these cells are a consequence of a genetic alteration in a single blood cell that occurred years previously. It's known as the Philadelphia chromosome translocation. Um, and what's happened is chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, both shown here in their normal form, have exchanged uh, the bottom parts of their chromosomes through something known as a reciprocal translocation. As a consequence, 9 is fused to 22 and 22 is fused to 9. And the Philadelphia chromosome is called the Philadelphia chromosome because Peter Knoll first noted that this chromosome 22 was smaller than the normal 22. He was working at the University of Pennsylvania uh, at the time. So let's look at this a little more carefully. So what's happening is there's a gene, a normal gene on chromosome 22 called BCR, another normal gene on chromosome 9 called ABLE, 
And as a consequence of this break and reciprocal translocation, we get a fusion. Uh, that results in the production of a fusion protein shown here. A lot about this protein. Um, this is the actual shape of the structure of the protein as solved through an atomic structure. This is just the, the, the enzymatic part of the protein known as the kinase domain. And I hope you can see it moving back and forth. Um, I really want to illustrate the concept that this protein is a machine. It has a function, and its function is to take ATP and transfer a phosphate residue from that ATP to another protein known as a substrate. And what you see now is the skeleton of the protein, and in particular, this activation loop moving from two positions, from an inactive to an active conformation. And it needs to do that in order to exert its function uh, of putting phosphate on substrate proteins. So that's critical information in thinking about how to make a drug that could interfere with that property. What if we could, what if we could make, find a chemical that could insert itself somewhere in this protein, see all the nooks and crannies, um, that would block the ability of the protein to do that activity? How would we find such a drug? Well, there's many ways you could think about doing it, but the way that's proven successful time and time again is to take advantage of robotic screening technology. And instead of trying to draw up such a compound, such a compound on the drawing board and see if it'll work, just screen millions of compounds that exist already in these chemical libraries. And that's exactly how Gleevec was found. Um, search through this library of millions of compounds and there it was, that was the activity that blocked the enzyme. That, there was the compound that blocked the activity of the enzyme. And that's its actual chemical structure shown here. So how does it work? Um, again, let's go back to the crystal st structure, the atomic structure of the protein. There's Gleevec right there in purple, inserting itself from the backside into what is known as the ATP binding pocket. And you can also see it has this long extension here that it goes all the way through the protein. And what you'll see is that extension here interferes with the ability of the activation loop to open. It's now stuck in the closed conformation. That's ATP in yellow trying to bind, and it can't bind because Gleevec is like gum in the lock. It's just completely blocked it up. Um, so, Once this compound had been discovered, it was advanced um, into clinical trials. And I was, again, lucky enough to participate as uh, one of the pr principal investigators in testing the very first patients who took this drug. This is a pill swallowed once a day um, with really minimal side effects, nothing like the side effects of chemotherapy. So here we are um, in the phase one clinical trial, trying to figure out if the drug is working. What's shown here is a plot of the white blood cell count on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And what you can see is all of these patients who were tested at this dose of the drug had blood counts well above the normal range, some as high as even 100,000. Normal range is below 8,000 shown here. And you can see that every single patient had a drop in their blood counts within 30 days down into the normal range. And this was sustained for three months. This is an unheard of success rate with a clinical trial. Um, furthermore, they had, there were very few side effects, if any. Um, it was like batting a thousand. Um, and when we looked much longer after three to six months, we saw that the Philadelphia chromosome was beginning to disappear in the bone marrow of these patients and eventually completely disappeared. disappeared. And that happened because the normal bone marrow cells that don't have BCRable are able to now resume growth and take over the bone marrow. And so the blood counts return to normal. However, um, some patients began to develop resistance. Their blood count started to go back up. And of course, this is an ominous finding, um, really took the wind out of our sails. Um, and we began to worry that, you know, had we really, you know, solve this problem to any su substantial degree, or was resistance going to become a major problem? Well, why do the patients have resistance? 
to figure out how the patients developed resistance, we sequenced the DNA from the from the patient's tumor cells. And what we found was remarkable. So what's shown here is the crystal structure again, now in ribbon form, um, of Gleevec called STI571, bound to the ATP binding domain of the BCRA-able pro protein. And what you can see here is the amino acid threonine, 315, present deep in that ATP binding pocket, um, forms a hydrogen bond with the drug. And this is, explains why it fits in so tight into that pocket. But in the patients who developed resistance, we found a mutation that resulted in that threonine over here on the left is now an isoleucine. Um, isoleucine is a different amino acid. It's much bigger. And you can see that because there's this bump or bulge that sticks into the pocket and it prevents the drug from binding. Furthermore, it can't form a hydrogen bond. So this is known as steric clash. And this absolutely explained why the patients were developing resistance. Just one mechanism. We started looking more broadly um, with across uh, a larger number of patients um, and in collaboration with other groups uh, who were treating patients with Gleevec who developed resistance. And we found that this 315 mutation here in orange was just one of many different mutations that could be associated with resistance. Um, you look at this, um, and at first glance, you almost want to throw up your hands. This seems like a hopeless situation. How are you going to overcome all these different escape routes that the tumor cells can come up with to get around Gleevec? Um, are you going to have to have you know, 20 or 30 more different drugs, each of which is designed to treat one of these resistance mutations? Well, fortunately, that's not the case. Um, you know, after thinking about this for a little while, we looked back at the atomic structure and tried to understand if there are any common themes. And what I'm going to show you next is that all of the ones in this uh, reddish color, so all but three, um, are, are mutations that interfere with the conformation of the protein, and that's why they cause resistance. So let me see what I mean on the next slide. Um, so if you remember, this is the inactive structure with the activation loop out, sort of sticking out of, out of the plane of the board. Um, and this is the active form with the activation loop going back you know, to the right, um, deeper into the molecule. Um, and when we looked very carefully at the position of each of these mutations here, what we noticed is they would be predicted to interfere with the ability of the enzyme, if it's, an, if it's active, to get back to the inactive state. In other words, they're causing a conformational um, interference with its normal flexibility. Um, and if you also remember, only in this position can Gleevec bind tightly and sort of fit behind that loop and interfere with the activation loop. So that's so now let's look at this concept uh, with an animation. What I'm showing you here is the actual atomic structure of the kinase domain of BCR-able in green with the activation loop in the open conformation in red. Um, so when I activate the movie, you will see that the activation loop is going to swing from the open to the closed conformation, just like this. That's now closed. And only in this shape can the drug Gleevec in purple bind. Um, and you can see the reason for that is because this part of the molecule clashes sterically with the mobility of the loop. In contrast, the, the drug in bluish fuchsia called desatinib is agnostic as to the shape uh, or position of the activation loop um, and can bind in any of these conformations. Therefore, a, a key prediction is that desatinib will be active against the, all the mutants that interfere with this computational flexibility. Story short, that's exactly the case. Um, we, uh, we showed that BCR-ABLE was effective, that the wild type, as well as all these different mutants of BCR-ABLE, were effectively inhibited by desatinib. Um, 
within a range of drug concentrations that are tolerable in patients. And then we ran the clinical trial that ultimately led to its approval as a drug to treat myeloid leukemia. Um, and just to give you a sense of this, um, it took 41 years from the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome in 1960 to the discovery of Gleevec, um, which is a very long time. Um, but it took that long because we had to advance many different fields in biology, basic science. So basic molecular biology, structural biology, which is you know the crystal structures and seeing the atomic shape of the protein, and then the chemistry to do such high throughput screening uh, using broadly uh, representative chemical libraries and robotics to speed up the process. But once we know these things and have these technologies, we can move very fast. Um, Desatinib, from the first time uh, we presented the idea of looking for a molecule that would fit in the ATP binding pocket in the way shown on the previous slide, to the, to the approval of the drug for CML was just five. So that, you know, now 15 plus years ago, really set a fire. Uh, set fire to the field uh, of using tumor sequencing um, and detection of mutations to develop targeted therapies. Um, but at that time, we really only had a handful or less of examples in which this had been successful, um, and they had come about largely through serendipity. So the question at hand was, can we do this at industrial scale in an organized way? Um, and again, technology came to the rescue. Um, one was the ability to sequence DNA at high speed and low cost, and the other was computational methods to analyze large bits of data. So, so here's, here's the problem um, as I like to uh, frame it. We know that cancer is caused by mutations in gene, in specific genes, these so called drivers. Um, and if we knew the names of all those genes and the proteins that were impacted by those mutations, we would have the list of proteins for which we need to make targeted therapies against. So we, meaning the larger cancer community, me as being one of the principal champions of this effort, um, said, why should we sit around and discover these one by one by serendipity, let's set the goal of defining all cancer genes now. So that gave birth to a project known as the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. And it was enabled by this remarkable technology breakthrough. Um, you may know that the original Human Genome Project was done using a technology which resulted in an expense of about a billion dollars to sequence the first human genome. Now, with this newer technology, we sequence genomes routinely, you know, thousands and thousands a day for literally a thousand dollars a genome. This puts this test for at the same price for clinical management as a CAT scan or an MRI. Um, and it can be done with great speed as well. So how do we lay out this project? Um, we wanted to compare the DNA sequences from patients' tumors to tissue from their non-tumor cells, um, identify any mutations or differences between the tumor and normal that are specific to tumor cells. We would call that a tumor-specific mutation. And then we filter out a few of the mutations that weren't going to result in a change in amino, an amino acid, and that would be our list of Now, what I mean is uh, the concept of a silent mutation. So again, take you back to your high school biology. As you'll, you'll remember that DNA encodes for RNA, and then RNA is translated into protein using the so-called triplet codon uh, um, concept in which three different nucleotides together um, encode for a different amino acid. So if this is the as, and it is the triplet codon for tyrosine, one, amino, one of 20 amino acids, you can see 
that C to a T also codes encodes for tyrosine, so that's a silent mutation. But these other alterations lead to um, a different amino acid substitution, in this case a cysteine, or in some cases a termination codon or a stop codon in which the protein is truncated uh, based on the mutation. So with that as the outline of the project um, and with the commitment from the National Cancer Institute um, to fund the project um, through team-based research across multiple institutions, we set out to sequence tens of thousands of tumors. Initially, starting with 500 at a time to work out the kinks, now this is such a routine process. We have registries that, can, that are open source, easily um, available to scientists to look up um, anywhere in the world um, of over 100,000 tumors of all different kinds. Um, and what have we learned from this? First of all, we've learned that the number of mutations per cancer differs. So what I've shown here is the number of mutations per tumor um, on this y-axis, um, and, and this by tumor type, and I'll reveal the different tumor types in just a second. And it's also categorized by adult and pediatric. So what can you learn from this? First of all, most adult cancers have between 50 to 100 mutations. Now, some of these are mutations in the actual drivers of the cancer. Others are just in random spots throughout the genome and do not have a functional consequence. It's also interesting that pediatric cancers have very few mutations. Um, and this um, remains a challenge for pediatric cancers because they don't have as many targetable driver oncogenes. But through the use of whole genome sequencing, um, we're beginning to find structural alterations that may shed light. Um, another interesting finding is the results in lung cancer. So there's three different types of lung cancer shown here. This type of cancer, lung cancer, is called adenocarcinoma. This is called squamous cancer um, and small cell cancer, which have high levels of mutations, and these tend to occur in smokers. Um, we know that smoking is a carcinogen, and it clearly leads to the production of more mutations per tumor. And an interestingly, skin cancer is right next to lung cancer, and that makes sense because melanoma, at least, is the type of skin cancer here, because um, these are caused by UV damage to the skin, which also results in mutations. And then finally, there's an example of colorectal cancer a subset of colorectal cancer in which there's defects in genes that actually are responsible for repairing mutations that occur in the normal everyday um, replication cycle of normal cells. Um, and those have mutations on the order of thousands of mutations. Um, so quite a variety uh, across tumor types. Um, but if you recall, the whole purpose of this exercise uh, amongst many, was to basically have the parts list for all the genes that cause cancer, the, the drivers. Um, and now we know the answer. Um, and then there's a couple of important points. First is, it's not every gene. You know, there are 20,000 genes in the human genome, but only a few hundred are cancer genes. And it's a lot of cancer genes, but at least there's a boundary. So we know the enemy, we know what we're facing. Now that we know this, um, what have we learned? Uh, and it's an enormous amount. Um, but I want to make one major point, and that is we've learned to think about how we diagnose cancer in a completely new way. Um, and this is in the area of taxonomy, or how we classify um, diseases. We've, of course, for decades, relied on clinical taxonomies, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Should we or can we now move to a genomic taxonomy in which cancers are classified based on the mutations that are causing them? And furthermore, can we make drugs against them? So I'm going to show you an example in lung cancer, which has been truly remarkable. 
all of which has taken place in less than 15 years. So we diagnose lung cancer from a tissue biopsy, and the, the, cell, the, the tumor cells are spread out on a slide, um, and they look like this. And a pathologist makes a decision as to whether it's adenocarcinoma, squamous, large cell, or small cell, based on these different patterns. This is morphology, pattern recognition. Well, from sequencing of just the adenocarcinoma part, we have this much heterogeneity. So this is a pie chart revealing the different mutations uh, that are found in these adenocarcinomas, each of which represents a mutually exclusive subset of cancer, um, and each of which behaves somewhat differently clinically, um, and each of which if one were to have a targeted therapy, would be treated differently. Um, and I'm, I'm amazed to be able to tell you in that short time frame, you know, compared to the 40 years it took to develop Gleevec for one form of leukemia, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've developed drugs against all of these different alterations, most of which are now approved therapies for treating these lung cancer patients. Um, I mean, this is truly remarkable. But have we identified all cancer genes? Um, now that we have them, uh, how, do we, how do we make sense of what to do next? Um, well, uh, one of the things that's emerged uh, is we now know the relative frequency of these mutations across different cancers. So here's an interesting plot generated by my colleagues here at Sloan Kettering, in which we total up all the patients who have mutations uh, in a particular gene, and the genes are listed along the x-axis. So the gene that's most frequently mutated in this plot is a gene called KRAS. It was also present on the previous plot. It's, an, it's one of the slices of the lung cancer pie. The second is a gene called BRAF. This is a gene that was first recognized as being important in melanoma, but it's also present in lung cancer, thyroid cancer, colon cancer, and so on. And the list goes on. And here's, here are the, and, and, and you know, here are the various frequencies. But I want, what I want you to see is what we call in my field, the long tail of cancer mutations. So we, we now go out you know, this is perhaps a dozen to 20 or so mutations here, but now we have this long tail in which we have clear driver mutations, but they're so rare in each tumor type um, that, you know, what are we going to do? Um, well, in the clinical trial field, we've developed a concept called basket studies or basket trials. Um, and here is the ultimate, you know, definition of, of applying a genomic taxonomy uh, to cancer diagnosis. So each of the individuals with the white dot has a mutation in the gene of interest. Um, and in order to do a clinical trial in the old schema, we would have to screen tens of hundreds of, of uh, lung cancer patients in order to find enough individuals with a white dot in order to enroll them on the clinical trial. A basket study screens all cancer patients, which is now possible because of the widespread use of sequencing technologies uh, in the diagnosis of cancer. And then we put all those, those patients into a, with the white dots into a single bucket uh, or basket and treat them with the same drug. And again, I'm excited to tell you there are now two and soon to be more drugs approved on the basis of basket studies, which are approved for every single patient who has the mutation regardless of the tissue type. Um, again, showing the power of genomics, chemistry, and therapy. So, in closing, I want to say 
that compared to when I was training not so long ago, um, where we had three pillars of cancer therapy, um, just in the last 20 years, we've added two more, targeted therapy, and as you heard from Dr. June, uh, immunotherapy, both of which are incredibly exciting um, and have uh, really galvanized not only the cancer research field, but also the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries, um, which have poured enormous amounts of their R&D resources into developing these new therapies. So why have we been able to make this process, th this progress? Um, why is cancer now more treatable? Um, the simple answer is we understand what causes it. Um, through decades of investment in basic science, um, not just in cancer, but in all basic science, we've been able to gather better knowledge of the genetic and cellular mechanisms of cancer. We understand cancer taxonomies at a way that is completely changing the way we diagnose patients in the clinic. We're gaining a better understanding of resistance. I showed you the example of resistance mechanisms to Gleevec through mutation in the BCR able gene, which is the driver. That same theme has played out with essentially all the examples of targeted therapies that have followed. Um, and since we know what's coming, we can anticipate the resistance mutations and work as quickly as possible on the next generation inhibitors uh, with the goal of overcoming resistance. Um, and all of this has led to an escalating number of new drugs and other treatment options that are improving um, the outcomes of cancer patients across a broad uh, number of types. But we're not done. Um, and I don't know when we're going to be done. We still have a lot of work to do to improve the lives of all cancer patients. And I've listed four um, points that I want to finish with. The first is that despite the power of DNA sequencing, there are patients in whom just sequencing, even at the whole genome level, we do not identify a driver mutation. Um, it's a minority of patients in which, is the, in which this is the case. It raises an interesting scientific conundrum. You know, why are these patients' tumor cells cancer cells if we can't find a mutation? I think we'll find it eventually. Um, but there are patients who are not benefiting from this kind of therapy because of that. Um, and as I briefly touched on, um, this problem seems to be the greatest in pediatric cancers. I'd say the second one, is a really challenging problem, and that is that we don't have drugs um, against many of the most common drivers, um, the tumor suppressor genes in particular, um, P53, P10. These are two of the most common ones, and we don't have drugs against them because it's not easy to restore the activity of a protein that's, been, that's now gone. Uh, or mutated. In the case of the oncogenes, we have an overactive protein that we, we can inhibit. Um, in this case, we have to restore the function of a gene. But hope is not lost. Um, there are examples of drugs now in clinical development or about to enter clinical development that do target some of these tumor suppressors. Um, and there's an interesting concept in which you can target the pathway that's upregulated as a consequence of loss of tumor suppression. The third bullet is one that I also have touched on in the Gleevec example, um, and that is resistance. Um, right now we're in a mode where predominantly we develop a new drug and use it as a single agent to treat a cancer based on the genetic driver. Um, those the success stories, you know, as I've told you, continue to increase, but resistance is essentially inevitable in all of these situations. Um, and how, do, how are we going to overcome that? We can develop next generation inhibitors, but we, we need to learn the lessons of infectious disease, particularly from tuberculosis and HIV therapy, where 
The same observations were made with single agent therapy and rational combinations were brought together in order to eradicate or cure uh, or make or convert these diseases to uh, a stable condition as is the case with HIV. So combination therapy clearly is the answer um, and the field is rapidly moving in that direction. So I wanna finish by sort of saying, since we have such a challenge ahead, um, should we restore the Cancer Moonshot Initiative that Vi Vice President Biden initiated during the Obama administration after his son Beau died of glioblastoma? I had the good fortune of meeting Vice President Biden four years ago um, uh, at his office to discuss the moonshot. And I sure hope we get a chance uh, to hear from uh, Mr. Biden again. Thank you very much. Scott, hello. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So that was pretty asked, exciting. That was an incredibly exciting talk. And also pretty exciting is where you are uh, seeing that talk from. Yes. The new digs are great. You're settling in OK? Yeah, I think so. Finding a way to use all that space you have now? I'll tell you, when we did the design process, um, we thought very hard about how the spaces could be used. And they're working great, just exactly like we thought they would be. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So happy for you all. So um, I, just a reminder to everyone that you can submit questions to pollev.com forward slash Nobel 56. And in a little while, while into Scott's and my conversation, we will uh, cut away to a, a poll, um, which, which they will post on the same place, pollev.com slash Nobel 56. So Scott, I wonder if you just want to offer a little... Um, your, your initial reactions, as you said, quite a talk. A little bit of it is wow. Um, I think one of the things that is highlighted in his work in particular is just serendipity. He got lucky in a couple of really important places um, and he'll acknowledge that. I'm not giving away any secrets here. Um, just to give you an example, you know, they said they did a library screen to try and find one of those molecules that would fit. Uh, a molecule of the size of Gleevec with that number of atoms, there's actually about 10 to the 60th possibilities of drug-like molecules. That's one with 60 zeros after it. That's a lot of different compounds. And so to find a needle in that big of a haystack is really pretty remarkable. So it really does mean that one of the most important things that we can do, and I know Bisan al Lazakani will be talking about how we can make that happen, is to reduce the amount of serendipity that is needed in, in uh, scientific discovery. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it was Pascal that said, um, or Pasteur, excuse me, that said that serendipity only favors those who are prepared for it. So I, I've always said I'd rather be lucky than good. And I think maybe good is knowing when you're lucky. And, <sighs> and Dr. Spears definitely knows when he's been lucky. No kidding. No kidding. I was really struck. So I've been listening to these talks back to back, of course, with the other things that are being streamed, including Helen King's wonderful three part history of cancer. And she looks at, uh, you know, these Egyptian papyri that say, you know, a a carcinoma, right, a lump on the breast or uh, a, a massive tumor. And as she says, the same word is used for all those. And I was really struck this time through in listening to Dr. Sawyer's talk about lung cancer, sort of the, the as he says, the morphology of lung cancer suggests that there's this giant uh, number of them that, are, that turn out to be different, but that, that all uh, traveled under the same name until now. I wonder if you just want to say a little bit about just gloss or, or, or restate that, that exciting transformation from talking about cancers as being associated with a particular body part and, you know, the morphology, um, the way that this notion of genome sequencing, uh, what did he call it, the uh, Cancer Genome Project, that that really transforms what, what's possible. I think that we could hear that again. Well, yeah, I think, you know, how we name things, we as, as humans really like to categorize things. And before we've only been able to say, well, this started in this particular type of, of uh, cell, this, this organ, you know, is it skin cancer? Is it lung cancer? Is it kidney? Is it pancreatic? And we can usually do a pretty good job of identifying the type of tissue that it originated in. 
But what's always been a little bit confusing is why some treatments work for some types of, of lung cancer, but not for other types of lung cancer. And when we start digging into the molecular basis, into the genetics, we start to see that there are very specific differences in the genes and the things that make those cancers different from each other. And so instead of categorizing them by what cell type did they arise from, what organ did they arise from, saying what their genes are and how they're similar genetically maybe makes a little bit more sense. So you can have, say, a kidney cancer and a lung cancer that have the same genetic defect and they could be treated more effectively with the same medication than, say, traditional kidney uh, chemotherapies or traditional lung chemotherapies. So it's just a different way of, of slicing and dicing and categorizing that's maybe more effective on this targeted basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as he said, it, it makes, you know, that his talk a little bit about that basket um, example that he was using where he was talking about the ways in which we can identify people with a particular genetic mutation and kind of clump them all together, even though they might be lung and kidney and so on. Sure. So instead of saying, well, you have stage two lung cancer, you're going to be in this clinical trial. What they can do is they can sequence the genome of that tumor and they can say, does it have this mutation or does it have that mutation? And instead of the baskets that they put people in being lung cancer or kidney cancer or pancreatic cancer, the basket they put them in is you have this gene defect or you have this gene defect. This is the cancer driver that you have. And so now you could have lung cancer and pancreatic cancer and kidney cancer in the same basket for the same clinical trial, which is really, I think, a revolutionary way to think about how to do those things. It really, it really is, and it strikes me as, you know, again, just an observer of science, this is going to change the way that we ordinary people think about what we have, what condition we have, which I kind of can't quite wrap my mind around yet. Another thing I can't quite wrap my mind around is uh, that only a few hundred genes are cancer genes, that, that we, are, we are within striking distance if we haven't actually hit that target of identifying all of the drivers. I mean, I... <laughs> I kind of, I kind of find myself saying, "Oh, that can't possibly be true." Look, we always keep thinking that we've almost gotten there, and surely we're going to find out we're wrong about this too. So tell me, I don't that I'm wrong, Scott. Tell me that actually this is a completely achievable goal. I can't, <laughs> and the reason I can't is because you know there are multiple types of mutations, as as he said in his presentation. There's several types of mutations even in just the one type of cancer that he was looking at, one driver. And so as cancers progress, as they get worse, more and more mutations arise. And so they're going to escape the traditional therapies, even if they're targeted. So I think that cancer is one of those things that's gonna keep us on our toes for an awful long time. Mm -hmm. But to keep that maybe a little bit more in our perspective, 20 years ago, we didn't talk about curing a cancer. And now we do. And that's remarkable. I think the work that we saw with Dr. June yesterday and the work we're seeing with Dr. Sawyers today really drives home the, the point that there are some cancers that are now curable through chemotherapies and through um, other biologics. That's remarkable. And I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Right. And you are, you are younger than I. I know when Dr. Sawyer's talks and when on the podcast, Science Wise, he talked about the fact that he now has the complete joy of, you know, receiving pictures of cancer survivors with their grandchildren. And uh, we're talking about multiple year survival with, for folks who had a death sentence, you know, a, a very, very short uh, life expectancy. Well, see, a picture of, what was her name, Emily? Uh, received that greeting from President Obama, it was, it was very emotional for me to see that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, something else that Dr. Sawyers talked about a number of times, uh, you know, he talked, for instance, about 41 years uh, for the emergence of Gleevec as a, as a therapy, um, despite the original discovery that really set the stage for it. Uh, and he said, you know, we need to, we needed sort of to like do molecular biology and structural biology and chemistry before we could get there. Uh, and sometimes I think for, for us in the lay public, we can sort of look at uh, basic science and think, why don't they get to the important stuff? Why are they off doing, you know, these things that seem 
kind of frivolous when they ought to be curing cancer. Uh, so what are we not understanding about the relation between basic and applied science when we, when we, when we say things like that? I think part of it is you don't know what the tools you need are until you get into a really complex problem. And when you're in the middle of a big problem, inventing new tools takes time, right? So, you know, one of the things he talks about the cost human genome project and, and numbers vary depending on how you count the costs associated with it. I think the NIH webpage says it's 14 million over 13 years. I've seen other costs that it's close to two and a half billion right, over 13 years. Um, but now you can do it for $1,000, $2,000 in a day or two. Right? Yes, yes. Why, why is it so much cheaper and so much more efficient now? And that's because of other disciplines asking completely different questions and solving different problems that people can then say, oh, well, there's a tool in my toolbox that I can use for this. So for example, microfluidics. Why would you think microfluidics would be really important to cancer? I wouldn't but actually it, know what microfluidics was. Could we just review that? Sure. Microfluidics is the, the, the way that you manipulate very, very small volumes of liquid, right? And so if you can manipulate small volumes of liquid, you can do all of the testing that you used to do on large scale because that's how you manipulated liquid um, on very, very, very small scale. So that helped contribute to minimization. Mm. Um, you know, I think detection, how do you know when a molecule is there or what that molecule is, has come an awful long way. And that's not directly related to cancer, but we've used those advances in uh, sequencing DNA. So we've come a long way from the old Sanger method uh, to be able to do it a lot faster and a lot, a lot cheaper on smaller scale. Smaller scale makes a big difference. Robotics. Robotics have changed everything, mm -hmm. right? So... Yeah. Those are things that we didn't think about, like, hey, we've got this problem in cancer, we need to invent a robot. Mm -hmm. Nope, that came from different disciplines, mm -hmm. asking different questions, right? So you never know when just asking a, huh, I wonder what it would be like if, when you start investigating things like that, someone else will come along and say, that is a great answer and we can use that over here, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to turn us to the poll, which it looks like has gone live. Uh, so if you'd like to go to poll everywhere, pollev.com forward slash Nobel 56. And uh, Scott, I think you can see the poll uh, results, which are coming in. Um, which statement best describes what you think about molecular targeted therapy? And again, there might be more than one of those statements that re re um, describes what you think. But um, which one? Uh, so does that result surprise you, Scott? Does it seem like what we might expect? Do you think it's, do you think we should have that much optimism about molecular targeted therapy? I, I think that having seen a couple of the talks over the last couple of days, that does not surprise me. Um, I think it's maybe a little over optimistic, but I think that it's, it's pretty close. I think there's a lot of cancers now that we can target very clearly though we still have the trouble with, um, with you know, drug resistance, what happens when they become resistant. So mm -hmm. as, a, as a frontline therapy, I think they're gonna become pretty commonplace, if not already very mm -hmm. commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, it's sobering that, as he said, uh, the place in which the uh, driver mutations are most often not identifiable after DNA sequencing is in children's cancers, and that's, that's hard to hear, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is very hard to hear. Um, and you'd like to see more cases like Dr. June talked about, um, but you still see a lot of radiation, a lot of really strong chemo, and um, it takes a toll, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Uh, Sawyer said, um, perhaps in a in the podcast interview, which so I'm a I'm a word person, as you know, Scott, and uh, metaphors work really well for me. And he said that um, chemotherapy is sort of going into a room where you want the lights to go off, and you swing a baseball bat around until you smash out all the light bulbs. And mm -hmm. in comparison, uh, targeted therapy says, oh, look, over there on the wall, there's a light switch. Perhaps we could turn it off. And for me, yep. that has been just, you know, as somebody who came up, you know, with friends and family who have experienced uh, chemotherapy, watching the ravages <laughs> of, mm -hmm. of chemotherapy, it's, it's 
really, this is just me quelling, I guess. It's devastating for the individual, and it's, it's also devastating for everyone around that individual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciated uh, comments earlier about care of the whole person and even care for the caregivers. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that he emphasized, given, as you said, some of these challenges like drug resistance and so on, he's emphasized the importance of um, combination therapies. And I think he sort of said, uh, you know, our experience with treating HIV and uh, some of these other um, conditions. What's going on there? Explain why a combined therapy would be so much more effective. Well, what you see with the mutations, and that's what's causing the drugs to become not effective anymore, uh, you see different populations. So some cells in one part of the tumor might have one genome profile, one set of mutations, but cells in the same tumor but a different part of the tumor might have different mutations, right? So you can have a different population of, of cancers even within the same tumor cell. Right, and so that one drug that is the magic bullet isn't gonna take all of those cells out. Some of them are gonna mm -hmm. stay behind and those are the ones that are gonna to continue to grow. But if you had multiple drugs that could take out multiple forms of that, of that tumor, um, you would be able to knock more of it out. So the same thing with AIDS. The reason that AIDS was so devastating is because the HIV, uh, the genome of HIV mutates rapidly, it's so variable. So you don't have just one form of, of HIV, you have multiple forms of HIV. And so you need multiple drugs to combat that, to get them all tamped down. So you don't have one that starts to dominate and, and, and show resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did that make sense? Yes, it did, yes. It, you know, I wish that I could formulate on the fly a question about coming to understand the process of mutation. Uh, but perhaps you can formulate a question for me and answer it. I mean, it feels like most of these things are coming back to, it keeps mutating on us. Um, sure. And is that the next stage of, do we need a human mutation genome project? <clears throat> um, well, they're, they're already starting to do that. And that's part of, of um, proteomics and that's the next stage of genomics. And that's partly what the, the cancer, cancer genome, genome project is trying to do, right? To, to map out all of the different mutations you can have. But the process um, of so mutations so mutating, I guess, is, mm, sorry. Yeah. So think about this. Um, think of the DNA as a story in a book, right? And each gene is a chapter in that book. And if you were a student and you were copying that, that story, how many typographical errors do you think you would make along the way? Well, there's machinery that will recognize, it'll proofread for you, and it will go back and erase the mistake and let the machinery come back and, and fix it so you can get rid of all of those typos. Those typos are mutations. And the, the problem is when those proofreaders start to become mutated and can't do their job, uh, you start accumulating more and more and more mutations, and that's as the disease progresses and these checkpoints start to get taken out, you get more and more mutations. So you get multiple populations with different amounts of, of mutation. That help with the, the book it analogy? It did, and I think, yes, it's, it helped very much. And I think a Zoom beer is in order on this one, Scott, because I think I needed a couple more, couple more chapters of, of that book. But thank you for that explanation, yeah. Um, I am going to make sure that we move our uh, discussion along. Do you have any last thoughts about what really stood out for you about Dr. Sawyer's talk today? I think the fact that we can get crystal structures, we can do the structural biology and know what those proteins look like so that then we can actually, with computers, put molecules into the places where we think they bind. That just blows my mind, right? That we can visualize these things. How do you see that? How do you visualize that? Um, that that's amazing and that's a large part of what made their project successful. Mm -hmm. And again, back to why we need basic science in all these different fields. Uh, the advances mm -hmm. in crystallography and in the end in uh, computational biology, presumably. Well, I'll just say art. 
So, so the arts really play a heavy part in how we think spatially and how we reason spatially. Mm -hmm. um, Lovely. Great. Well, thanks for your time, Scott. And we're, now we're going to queue up our last talk, a talk, by the way, which very nicely leads us to Nobel, uh, Nobel Conference 2021, or Nobel 57, about which you'll hear more at the very end of the conference. So I would like to introduce my colleague in uh, the Department of Math and Computer Science, Melissa Lynn. When we talk about data science and artificial intelligence, we often focus on targeted advertising, facial recognition, self-driving cars,